Castlevania is back, and any concerns that the interlude between series or the entirely new cast of characters would somehow erode its quality are erased minutes into the premiere. A young Richter Belmont watches his mother fight for her life against a powerful vampire, Olrox. Her apparent concern tells viewers that she knows it's a losing battle, but this doesn't diminish any tension because the tragedy of the scene is that what she knows and we know, Richter doesn't. He's confident that his mother, who has slain so many vampires before, will dispatch this one just as easily. He is, of course, sorely, tragically mistaken. Olrox kills the Belmont. He spares her son, but leaves him with a powerful lesson about the cycle of violence. Julia Belmont killed someone Olrox loved, so he came for revenge. It's a theme appropriate for the time in history that Castlevania Nocturne occupies, the time of the French Revolution. It's easy to be taken with Maria's words liberty, equality, fraternity, but if the series progresses further through history into the following two years, it will get much bloodier with no help needed from vampires. The revolutionaries fought for some good ideas, though even on that front, things were messy. They claimed liberty as an ideal, yet the abolition of slavery was not uniformly supported. Slaves had to fight for their own freedom, something Nocturne highlights. And even when they were fighting in the name of ideals, many fought not only with justice in their hearts, but also vengeance. 1792, the year in which this first season takes place, already includes the September massacres. Revolutionaries had jailed many of their opponents in Paris, including clergy. And as the number of political prisoners rose, so did the paranoia that they may mount a counteroffensive. So the people, the people fighting for the ideals listed enthusiastically by Maria, descended on the prisons and slaughtered somewhere between 1,100 to 1,600 people. Men forced themselves on women, disemboweled priests, and hacked aristocrats to pieces. Some of this complexity, wanton violence in the name of a greater ideal, is alluded to by the abbot. He tells the story of an 82-year-old woman in his parish who is forbidden by her grandson from communion in the name of reason. Over 200 priests were massacred in Verdun, and he accurately predicts it won't be long before priests are exiled or put under the guillotine. Of course, he is far from innocent himself. Few innocent men house machines forged in hell in their basements. From late 1793 into 1794, there was the Reign of Terror, where the revolution which sought to abolish an oppressive government became exactly that, revoking their own constitution and instituting martial law to tamp down anyone who opposed revolution, using the wrong words or even using the right ones, but failing to show enough enthusiasm for the revolution was enough to send you on a one-way trip to the guillotine. Much of this was led by Maximilien Robespierre. Only a few years earlier, he was a staunch opponent of the death penalty, but now he oversaw and called for thousands of beheadings. And in the end, he himself would end up under the guillotine and finally bring an end to the terror. It seems that violence, while it may sometimes be a necessary force for change, it can also be a corrupting one and always comes at great cost, more and often escalating violence. Julia Belmont kills vampires, so a vampire kills Julia Belmont planting vengeful seeds in the heart of her son, Richter. Will he succumb, like so many revolutionaries, or will he find some other way to reconcile the hate Ulrox put in him? There is hope. Richter already has some concept of the cyclical nature of violence. Ulrox explained it to him after slaying his mother, and in episode 6, he gets another dose of this lesson, from his grandfather, Just Belmont. He was the most powerful magician the Belmont line ever produced, but he lost that magic, just like Richter did after the death of his mother. It was similar for Just. For years, he killed vampires. That put a target on him, just like his daughter. But unlike Julia, it wasn't him who died. It was his wife, Liddy, and his friend, Maxim. Both were killed by the vampire, Lord Ruthven, and that day, 
magic left him. To Richter, his grandfather is an aged reflection. He has a glimpse of who Richter may become if he isn't careful, and shortly after hearing the story, Richter's magic returns to him. Some vampires catch him and Juiced by surprise. Both will be killed, but watching his grandfather moments before impending death, Richter remembers his mother, and he thinks of the people that he loves. His magic returns, and he reduces the vampires to ash. Why did the magic come back, and why did it leave him in the first place? The in-universe explanation would seem to be psychological. The sorrow of loss was damaging enough to blunt their abilities, but where Joost became a hermit and never found anything beyond sorrow, Richter made himself a new family, with someone like a mother, someone like a sister, and Annette, perhaps someone he can fall in love with. Remembering all this love is what brought his power back, not vengeance. Perhaps even when you're fighting for the right cause, the content of your heart matters. Is it love that drives you, or hate? Castlevania Nocturne makes it clear which is better, and which will grant you more strength. Where this series uses magic to emphasize the good, it uses vampires to emphasize evil. Of course it gets more complicated than that. There are bad vampires who use magic, and there are vampires who do good. Some fall somewhere in between, like Olrox, who kills innocents, but also resists Urzabet, the first season's ultimate villain. But by their nature, vampires feed on blood, and it's either a requirement or at least a general preference that it comes from humans. And where have the vampires chosen to place themselves in society? They've coiled around nobles and clergy, the minority of the population that holds most of the power. This includes slave owners. In fact, the one who killed Annette's mother was a vampire himself. The first Castlevania series explored the thing that drives one to evil. Often, it results from giving in to intense emotion, like Dracula taking revenge on all of humanity for the few who burned Lisa at the stake, or giving in to a perceived nature, like the night creatures, who exist to kill, destroy, and despoil, until Isaac teaches them to be instruments of creation rather than destruction. Castlevania Nocturne explores a specific flavor of evil, one that has permeated through much of human history, the notion of one person taking dominion over another, the most stark and brutal manifestation of this being slavery. Vampires have embedded themselves in this controlling class. They hope to quash the revolution, and many fight for the rise of a vampire messiah, Urzabet Battery. She promises to take control of the world, envelop it in perpetual darkness, and put vampires in charge. There is an element of revenge in her motivation. She despises the sun, which is deadly to vampires, and promises to bring Amun-Ra, a fusion of two Egyptian gods, including Ra the sun god, to his knees. She herself was a priestess of Sekhmet, the Egyptian goddess of war and vengeance. She drank of the goddess's blood and now draws power from it power she hopes will lead to world domination. She tells her right hand, I dreamt last night about the world we are making, the Empress of Russia, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Ottoman Sultan, the Pope, all kneeling before me, kissing my feet. Subjugation, the destruction of freedom, these are the designs of Nocturne's antagonist, and the evil it most concerns itself with. It's an evil that can rear its head even when the best intentions are used. The abbot, for example, believes he is doing good in the name of God. Yes, he struck a deal with some demon for a machine capable of forge mastering. Yes, he sacrifices common people in the creation of night creatures. But he is only doing so to create a temporary alliance with the vampire messiah, because he knows that in a traditional war between them, the messiah would win. So instead, he's playing a long game, going along, making sacrifices, and surviving. He even comes close to sacrificing his own daughter. But are these his decisions to make? Perhaps there's another path to survival, or even victory, but he's blinded by his place in society. He is clergy. He is above the common people. He knows better. He can decide to sacrifice them, if he deems it right. Is he aware of Annette's great magic? 
passed down through her ancestors from the source, the god Ogun? Is he aware of Richter Belmont's power, inherited from the great sorceress Sypha? And is he aware that there is a vampire who fights for the side of good, the son of Dracula, Alucard? There is power on the side of good, but vanity blinds the abbot. He appoints himself humanity's savior and decides it's his duty to make the tough decisions on their behalf without conference with anyone outside the church. He presents himself as a pure man of God while making deals with devils and sacrificing the common people, of course never the nobles, and of course he doesn't do the killing himself, but stands by while vampires slaughter, providing him fresh corpses, a necessary ingredient for night creatures. The first Castlevania series posited that thought and creation are the ideals people should strive for, with death representing their opposite, just a thing that eats. Watch my analysis on that series for more on this. But thought and creation are only possible with freedom, and in this series, the vampire messiah hopes to snuff it out, for people at least. In this series, freedom is such an ideal that Edouard remembers it before he remembers his own name. As a night creature, he tells Olrox, I don't know what happened, who I am, what I am, but I want my freedom. That's how fundamental a desire it is. Life, even before it knows itself, wants to be free. That's why oppression is such a dangerous proposition, the sort which can lead to violent uprising. And art, in Edouard's case singing, is one of the purest expressions of freedom because it's limited only by one's own ability, determination, and creativity. Annette says that Edouard believed singing was the soul's way of speaking. Perhaps his singing, his celebration of the soul itself, is what allowed him to retain his as a night creature. He holds on to some of his memories and humanity, while the rest become obedient monsters. And then some are freed by his singing, because the soul wants to be free and Edouard reminds them of this. The desire for freedom is not exclusive to humans either. Vampires share it too. Olrox and Drolta describe how they can tell when the sun comes up, even without watching. Some quality in the air changes, Olrox says, and Drolta describes it further. We all feel it. It's dread. For a few hours, we're free of it. Imagine total freedom, never shrinking from light. That's what the Messiah promises freedom. But of course, it's freedom at the cost of others. And in addition, she's hoping for world domination. There's inherent pessimism in this series' very existence, because it says that although our heroes won the first round, evil always returns. The cynical Just says it like this, evil will always win, Richter. Whatever it is, evil. And it's everywhere. It will always be stronger than us. And you can kill this or that devil, a Lord Ruthven, a Dracula, maybe even an Olrox. But there will always be more, more and worse, and they'll murder the people you love. No one around you are safe. Evil will always win. The vampire who killed Annette's mother claims that immortals, kings, humans, peasants, and slaves are the natural order, where some have power over others. But Cecile points out that slavery is a man-made phenomenon. If you follow their ancestry back to the source, you reach a world free of it. As the vampire dies behind a net, burning in the sun, she finally concludes, the sun is rising, devouring the darkness. It always does. This is the natural order. The illusion is that evil's presence often can't be known until it takes action, so we can't see the force of good until it responds in kind. Think of that scene where a vampire bursts into a saloon. From his perspective, these good people are weak. All they can do is drink and dance. But there were two Belmonts in that bar. He didn't stand a chance. Evil makes itself known, kicking down doors, murdering and stealing. Good is capable of the same, but keeps its weapon sheathed until a call to arms is necessary. This will cause evil to underestimate their foe. Annette's enemies were taken by surprise when her magic manifested and gave her a chance to escape. Same with Richter's enemies. And this is the note the season ends on. The vampire messiah sees nothing in her path that will stop her ascent. 
nor does Drolta, but as she dives toward the heroes, an unexpected blade stabs through her. Alucard returns. Once again, the side of good pierces the illusion that it's weak, that it's simply waiting, ripe for evil's taking. It's not weak. The truth is that it's strong, but the side of good doesn't show its full strength until it's needed. So when he's needed, Alucard returns. I'm sure there'll be some bloody battles ahead, and evil may win a few of them, but in the end, I expect good to prevail. As Annette said, the sun always rises to devour the darkness. That is the natural order. I think we can wrap it up there. Let me know your thoughts on Nocturne in the comments. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. With that, thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.